Featuring an intercontinental cast of voice actors, you're listening to Project Audio. Before we begin, let's pay a visit to a Christmas long past. This is London, the very Victorian 19th century London of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. It's a very specific setting for the classic Christmas book. Hi, I'm Larry Groby with the Generic Radio Workshop. Yeah, you, uh, you think of A Christmas Carol and you think of Dickensian London. And yet, the story in this little book has been adapted into so many forms and places, and it's such a good story that it still works. Yes, London, but sometimes with puppets. Or with Mr. Magoo. Or Mickey Mouse. More transplanted to the modern day with Bill Murray. Or Cicely Tyson. And if you think about it, the movie It's a Wonderful Life is kind of a twist on the story, with Lionel Barrymore playing Scrooge and Jimmy Stewart as an anguished Bob Cratchit. Meanwhile, on the radio in the 30s and 40s, Lionel Barrymore portrayed Scrooge for many years in a much-loved network version of A Christmas Carol. Jimmy Stewart also starred in a radio adaptation of A Christmas Carol, set in the American West. It was an episode of a series called The Six Shooter. It ran in, for a year in 1953 and starred Stewart as a lone cowpoke named Britt Ponsett. How does A Christmas Carol translate into the Old West? Stay tuned. Our Project Audion cast comes from Texas, of course, but also Hollywood and even all the way back to Charles Dickens, England. We wish you all season's greetings and hope you enjoy our take on A Christmas Carol. Here's a last minute Christmas shopping suggestion. What will you hear in your kitchen after Christmas? Bacon sizzling, coffee perking, dishes clinking, and if you're lucky, a new sound. NBC Radio listening on that new set. The perfect gift to lighten mother's long hours in the kitchen. Kitchens ring with happy chimes when tuned to NBC. James Stewart as the Six Shooter. The man in the saddle is angular and long-legged. His skin is sun-dyed brown. The gun in his holster is gray steel and rainbow mother of pearl. Its handle unmarked. People call them both the Six Shooter. The NBC Radio Network presents James Stewart as The Six Shooter, a transcribed series of radio dramas based on the life of Britt Ponsett, the Texas plainsman who wandered through the Western territories, leaving behind a trail of still-remembered legends. There was a nip in the air. Not a freezing, biting, angry nip, but a sort of tingle that made this morning stars shimmer and swing out of their orbits a little closer to the Earth. It was a winter nip, all right, but not a hard winter. Not a winter when the cattle would come down from the high places, hooking their noses into the ice-encrusted ground. It was a mild winter nip, mild enough so that the breath on the boy on the pinto turned only a faint gray as he rode toward the campfire where the man was sitting. Howdy. Hello, mister. I see your fire. I thought maybe you wouldn't mind if I gave my pony a chance to warm up. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, but make yourself at home. Easy, Blackie, easy. You headed for Thompson's Corner, mister? No, that's right. I just came from there. 
No, why did, did you? Was you riding all night or? Just about. You see, I'm running away from home. Oh, is that so? Uh, yeah. Well, I, you know, it seems kind of a funny thing you'd pick this time of the year to run away. I mean, you know, so close to Christmas. I mean. Oh, I hate Christmas. Oh. It, it's just for kids, anyhow. Well, I, I, I don't. I heard Aunt Millie say so. Christmas is for children. That's what she said. Johnny's old enough to do without all that fuss and nonsense. I heard her tell Mr. Franklin that. Oh, you, you, you don't live with your folks, huh, Johnny? No, sir. They died about eight months ago. Oh, yeah, I, I see. Christmas was, was, was all right when they were when I was with them. Of course, I was a lot younger then. Oh, yeah, sure, yeah, yeah. It, it just beats me the way folks take Christmas so serious. Well, I, I don't know. Uh, As if getting presents made any difference. As if I really cared about that knife. Oh, well, why, is that, that what you wanted, a pocket knife? I don't want a knife. I don't want anything. I, I just wish there wasn't any Christmas. That's all. Uh-huh, yeah. Well, you know, I, I guess you aren't the first person to feel that way. You know, it seems to me, it seems to me I remember reading a story once about a fellow who, you know, felt the same way about Christmas as you do. It, it, you just didn't have any use for it. What happened to him? Well, I, you know, I doubt if I could call it to mind after all this time, but, you know, as I recollect, uh, well, now, mind you, this might not be word for word, but as I recollect, the, the man that it's about, the one that hated Christmas, that is, well, he he was real skin flint, he was, just, just as stingy as they come. Yeah, his, his name was, um, yeah, let me see, Eben, something like that. Eben? Eben, yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure that was it. Well, you know, being so tight-fisted, this fellow Eben, he got to be the richest man in the whole territory. He owned a ranch? Oh, sure, sure. He he had four of them, four, four ranches and store buildings and a farm and, you know, maybe a bank or two. He was rich. I bet he had a mighty fine ranch house. No, no, he, he didn't have a ranch house. It'd be, Eben was, wasn't the sort to spend money on a ranch house unless there was profit in it. He, he just lived alone in town, and had himself a steady room at the hotel. And, well, but, but anyway, one night while Eben was sitting in his room having supper, Christmas Eve it was, on, on this particular Christmas Eve, he, his only kin, a, a nephew, lived in the same town. He stopped by the hotel and... I come to wish you a Merry Christmas, Uncle, and invite you to our place for dinner tomorrow. Christmas? Fiddlesticks! Fall de Ral. I suppose you'd be closing up your livery stable for the occasion. Why, sure, Uncle Ib. And just how will the horses know it's Christmas? <laughs> Answer me that! Well, if they don't know it, we will. Can I tell old Sally to expect you at three? You can expect me all you like, but I ain't coming. Not at three or any other time. Oh, if you're making so much money you can afford to be giving parties, maybe I ought to think about raising the rent on the livery stables. Oh, now. Now get out of here before I lose my temper. All this nonsense about Christmas. Fiddlesticks. Pull the roll. Well, after that, Johnny, the, the nephew didn't stick around there. He, he got out of Eben's hotel room with a regular gallop. But it wasn't very long before Eben had another visitor. He, he was a young fellow, tall, lanky, not very good at speaking, it, it, just plain, ordinary cowpoke. He, he, he was the foreman of the S&M ranch. Uh, oh, well, it took you long enough to get here. Where have you been, selling off some of my herd without telling me about it? No, sir, no. The day you rode by, I was out in the range hunting strays. And a good thing I desired to check up on you, too. What's that cabin doing over by Holly Creek? And who are those people staying there? Well, they're, they're my family. I, I built the shack for them myself. I'm not going to have a bunch of nesters in my property. Tear it down. But one of my boys has been sick. I... I can't afford to rent. As if it was my concern. It's up to you to take care of your family and what you earn. So see that you get rid of that shack 
tomorrow. But tomorrow's Christmas. <laughs> oh, well, then you'll have plenty of free time to tear it down. I'll be out the day after to be sure you've done it. Good night. Well, there wasn't much use in arguing. The foreman knew that, so he put on his hat and shuffled out. Now, now Eben was alone again. And, well, at least he thought he was alone. Uh, the clock on the mantel started striking eight, and it, that meant it was time he turned in. <sighs> so he, he put on his flannel nightshirt, and he reached for the kerosene lamp to put on the stool beside the bed, and... Right about then, the strangest thing happened. What? What in tarnation? And Johnny, old Eben saw a man's face looking right back at him from inside the lamp. And, you know, eyes and hair, nose and mouth, whiskers, and just as plain as day. Jake! It, it was old Jake, Eben's partner. Well, there wasn't any mistake about it at all. It, it, it was Jake all, all right to a T. Well, Eben wasn't you know, sure he liked the idea of having Jake right in the room with him, you know. It, you see, Jake had been dead for over seven years. But, well, not that Eben really believed in ghosts or haunts or anything like that. He told himself he was just imagining all this. Uh, uh, I gotta get a hold of myself. He put out his hand to turn down the wick, but all of a sudden his fingers started trembling. There was Jake again, across the room this time, standing right by the mirror. No! And when the lamp slipped out of his hand, the room didn't get dark at all. Jake seemed to be surrounded by a splotch of bright yellow light, and he was wearing the same boots and breeches and leather jacket that he'd had on seven years ago, the day he died. But as Jake came closer, Eben could see he wasn't wearing, he was wearing something else. A small leather saddle strapped across his back, and hanging down from it were two saddlebags, stuffed so full of gold nuggets and mortgage papers and land grants that Jake could hardly drag him across the floor. Eben? Eben? You recognize me, Eben? Uh, sure, uh, it's you, Jake. Uh... Why, Sha, I would never forget you. But what are you doing here? And why are you wearing the get-up? Always thinking about land and money. Always scheming and conniving. That's why I wear it. And that's why I've come to warn you, Evan. The saddle you are fixing up for yourself is even heavier than mine. But I don't know what you mean, Jake. I, I ain't done no wrong. I never done folks no wrong. Have you ever done them any good? Any good at all? Why, sure. I've worked hard. I've saved my money. I ain't been a burden on anybody. Oh, you should see our ranches, Jake. Oh, the way I have built them up. I have seen them many times. And I've seen a lot more than that. That's my punishment. To spend eternity traveling around, seeing mankind with its trials and tribulations, with its joys and hopes. Is that so terrible? Oh, Evan, to watch them and not be able to help them. You'll find out how terrible it is. You'll find out. There must be some way of avoiding this. Uh, eh, you always were my friend, Jake. T tell me what, what to do. Evan, you've got to find out for yourself. But how? Tonight, at one o'clock, you'll be haunted by a ghost. Another ghost? Indeed, Evan. Pay him some heed. Wait. Wait, Jake. Don't, don't, don't leave me with you. Jake! The, the yellow light sort of faded away, and, and the ghost was gone. It was just like he hadn't ever been there. 
And and then then something caught the corner of Evan's eye. There's a little glimmer on the floor, and he bent over to pick it up. What's this? A gold nugget? Hmm. Now where on earth did this... And then he remembered the, those saddlebags of Jake's. They, they'd been filled clear to the brim with gold nuggets. We're interrupting our story for only a moment and only to tell you, our unseen audience that you have helped us more than you realize to make this a very Merry Christmas for all of us on this program. Your being with us each week, your many kind letters have told us that all the work that goes into bringing you the six-shooter has not been in vain, and we are grateful. So, friends, from all of us, Jimmy Stewart and the cast, our writer, our director, our engineers and sound technicians, our best wishes for a happy holiday season. Oh, oh, yes, and before I forget it, beginning December 31st, The Six Shooter will be on the air on Thursdays instead of Sundays. That's beginning Thursday, the 31st. The time of broadcast will be listed in your local newspaper. Thank you. Now, Act Two of The Six Shooter, starring James Stewart as Britt Ponzit. Jake's ghost really had been there, huh, mister? Yep, there just wasn't any doubt about it, Johnny. Well, what happened then? Did the other spook turn up? The one Jake said was coming to see Evan? Oh, sure, Johnny, sure, yeah. He, he was right on time, too. Evan had been lying in bed, wide awake, of course. He, he hadn't been able to do much sleeping, you know, too scared. But, you know, it was kind of peculiar. Evan was half scared the ghost would come in, half scared he wouldn't. But before the sound of the clock had died away, there he was. He, he was sitting in the Evans rocking chair like he'd been there all night long. And this ghost was a young fellow, maybe 18 or 19, all, you know, duded up the way young bucks like to dress. You know, fancy chaps and checkered shirt and red bandana tied around his neck. Howdy, Evan. Heard you been expecting me. I, I guess so. You ready to take a little trip? Where to? Back, way back through the years. But how can I go? Oh, it's real easy. You see, I am the ghost of Christmas past. Your past, Evan. Let's shove on. Well, the next thing Evan knew, he he and that ghost were standing out on a snow-covered prairie. There was a circle of covered wagons in front of them, and the people from the wagons were gathered together listening to a tall, white-bearded man. He, he was reading the Bible. And unto them fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And the ghost turned and pointed to a boy sitting away from the others on the tailboard of one of the wagons. A small boy, oh, you know, ten years old, with hollow cheeks and his eyes all red from crying. Oh, no! It, it was Evan himself on a Christmas day a long, long time ago. Not a very happy Christmas, either. It was only a week since the oxen stampede and his ma had been killed when she fell from the wagon. And, and his paw died from an Apache arrow in his chest. Oh, oh, I don't want to look at him anymore. Can't you show me another Christmas? Well, it was no sooner said than done. Now, Evan and the ghost were in a bunkhouse, and then Evan saw himself again. He, he was ten years older than the boy in the prairie. He was lying on a blanket, staring up at the ceiling, and then his pal Jake came running in all out of breath. Come on, Eb. Get a clean shirt on. We got an invite to a party. Huh? Yeah, the boss is throwing a big shindig. Says he'll fire us if we don't show up. (laughs) 
Uh, Eben couldn't help remembering that party. All oh, the roast beef and the baked ham, square dancing, and the pretty girls in their calico. He couldn't help saying out loud to the ghost. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I wish I... What was that, Eben? Uh, uh, nothing, uh, Mr. Spirit. Nothing at all. I was just remembering how I treated my foreman today. Uh, uh, that's all. And and after that, the, the ghost took Eben to three or four more of those Christmases, you know, and none of them were very happy, especially that Christmas when the young schoolmarm, sitting on the horsehair sofa, unwrapped the tiny box Eben gave her and, well, then handed it back to him. It's a lovely ring, Eben, but I can't wear it. Oh, you're... Oh, you're not caught in somebody else. No, Eben, but you are. You're courting something else. Belle? Land and money, cattle, profits. They mean more to you than I ever would. I'm sorry. Mr. Ghost, no, no more of the past. Please, I've seen enough. A man wants to forget. Sure, Evan, whatever you say. And before Eben could blink his eyes, he was right back in that hotel room. But once he got there, he blinked real hard because all of a sudden the ghost was becoming a different person. He was getting fatter, and his stomach popped out in two, you know, two or three inches. A few wrinkles creased his cheeks, and finally his chaps turned into a shiny blue serge suit with, with a heavy gold chain dangling across the vest. Well, what's happened to you? Why are you so different now? You seem to be getting tired of the past, so I thought we might take a gander at the present, if you got no objections. The hotel room just melted away, and Eben was looking at that cabin the foreman had built on Holly Creek. <laughs> well, that cabin sure was crowded. Oh, there must have been five or six children all helping their mother get out the Christmas dinner, and all laughing and talking, as busy as summer colts. But when their father came in, he, he had a long face and tired mouth. His wife looked up and wanted to know what was troubling him. Well, I was just thinking about old Eben. <laughs> well, that's a very... That's not a very pleasant thought for Christmas, Bob. Oh, by the way, what do you want to tell me yesterday? Was it about the cabin? Uh, oh, uh, no, 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 of course not, no. <laughs> well, let's get on with dinner now. Sit down, everybody, now. Uh, where's my Tim? Well, I guess we're just going to have to eat without him. I now, Bob right? looked all around the room. He was pretending he didn't see a little fellow over there in the corner, the boy with an iron brace on his leg and, and a wooden crutch up against the wall. But little Timmy wasn't going to be ignored. Here I am. Oh, oh, Bob picked him up and carried him over to the table. Now, God bless this food, this house, and us, and our friends, even old Eben. Amen. Well, well, the family found that part about Eben a little hard to swallow, but, well, they finally managed, and Tim was the last one to chime in. God bless us, everyone. Oh, yeah. I'm blessed. I blessed him. Evan didn't want to watch what was going on in that cabin any longer, but the, the next place the ghost showed him wasn't much easier on him. It, it was a big party going on at his nephew's house. <laughs> One of the ladies was blindfolded, and well, she was trying to pin the tail onto a donkey. But there was something peculiar about this donkey, about the you know way it was drawn. It, it looked more like a person than an animal. Well, Eben recognized who it was supposed to be right away. Folks, I invite Uncle Eben to be here with us, but he turned me down flat. So I figured to have him here in spirit, if not in the flesh. <laughs> Right back in the hotel room again. That's where Eben found himself. Spirit! Spirit! You showed me the past, the present. What's left to see? The future, Eben. The future. 
And that's how Eben came to see a Christmas of the future. A cold, brittle Christmas. There were two men standing on a street corner, cold collars turned up so they could keep out the snow, you know. Oh, he's dead all right. Dead as a doornail. Sure as a Christmas present I never expected. At least whoever handles his property won't be as hard to deal with as he was. I wonder if they'll bother giving him a funeral. And in a frame house on the side of the street, on the edge of town, a woman was speaking to her husband. Funny. To me, he's been dead for years. Why, I haven't even thought of him since I don't know when. Wouldn't you know, once... Once, I was really fond of him. Ghost! Who are they talking about? Those men on the street, that woman I used to know. Who is it that's dead? Tell me! And the ghost slowly turned and stretched out a long, thin, bony finger. And, and right there at the end of that finger was a tombstone, all covered with weeds. Evan could barely make out the name that was covered on it. Ebenezer Scrooge. No! 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 What's this? Where am I? Oh, shucks, where am I? You, you know what? He, he was right in his own bed, in his own nightshirt, and the sun was streaming in through the frosted windows. But, but Evan didn't stay there for, for very long. Oh, no, not, not very long. He got into his boots and trousers as fast as he could and dashed down the stairs, out onto the street. Well, seeing the store had been closed gave Evan quite a problem. Well, he, he had to make Fuzzy Wagner just open the butcher shop, and that's all to it. Well, of course, Fuzzy didn't have a choice, seeing that the shop was located at one end of the building. When Evan told him what he wanted, a turkey and a ham, well... No! Nah! 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 No! You better make it two hams and send it up to the cabin on the S&M ranch, and then not to know that I ordered them. You understand, Fuzzy? Here is the money. And a little extra for your troubles. Before Fuzzy could get his jaw shut up again, Evan was on his way, headed straight out to his nephew's house. And Evan was the life of the party, too. Oh, the way he carried on laughing and making jokes, telling stories about himself. But he insisted that when they used that donkey to put his face on it when they played games. Because <laughs> that's what I have been all of these years. A real four-footed, long-eared donkey. Yeah! yeah. <laughs> yes! <laughs> uh, the next morning, though, uh, that's what Eben enjoyed the most. He, he was right up bright and early and hitched the team to the buckboards and drove out to the S&M, hurrying the horses all the way. Come on, Bess! Come on, Martha! <laughs> if he could just get out there before his foreman started tearing down that cabin, I... Slow, my best. Slow, Martha. Yeah, ah. Well, Robert? Uh, yes, sir. I see you ain't carried out my orders. Uh, well, uh, well, it was, it was Christmas. I... I just couldn't tell them. I'll, I'll do it today. No. This is the last straw. I'm not putting up with your shenanigans any longer, young fellow. That cabin is coming down, and no buts about it. And then... And then... We're putting up a new ranch house in its place big enough for you and your whole family! What? Oh, yes. I'm also doubling your wages as of last week. Merry Christmas, Bob. Even if I am a day late. No, not a day. More like half a lifetime. But Merry Christmas anyway. 
And as your son says, God bless us, everyone. Well, that's the way things worked out, Johnny, more or less. It's a fine story, mister. Real fine. I reckon know why you... I reckon I know why you told it to me. Well, how, how's that? So, I understand about Christmas and how important it is to do for other people instead of just thinking about yourself. Well, no, no, I, I, I didn't have that in mind especially. A story just happened to come into my head, that's all. Well, I would like to give Aunt Millie something. A present, maybe. Oh, shucks. What could I give her? I don't have no money. Well, of course, there are lots of things that don't cost one penny. Not, not a single red cent, you, you, you know. Hmm. Well, no, you no, let's see. Take that little spruce over there. It'd be real easy to cut that down and with a little fixing and maybe a few doodads from around the house. And, you know, I bet you could make a Jim Dandy Christmas tree out of that. I suppose so. What's a tree without something to put under it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. see what you mean there. I, well, I, oh, Johnny, you don't happen to know Jim Bender, do you, in Thompson's Corner and, and his three daughters? He's only got two. Sarah and Emma. Oh, yeah, that's all. Well, I, you know, I'm spending Christmas with them. Hmm, I, yeah, it looks like I'm carrying an extra present. I, it's a real pretty little red bonnet with feathers on it. I, I couldn't take it, mister. Oh, no, no, I, I wasn't thinking of giving it to you, Johnny, but, you know, I, I was just sort of hoping you'd show me the trail from here on. You know, of course, it'd mean you'd turn it around going back home and... If I was the cause of you changing your plans, well, I'd, I'd feel obligated to pay you back in some way, you you know. Well, I... Well, no, now it's only fair. It, the trouble is, I haven't got much money, so I... Well, you know, Johnny, if you wouldn't mind accepting me giving you the bonnet, you'd be doing me a real favor. She looks madder than a wet hen. Yeah, well, that is kind of a resemblance. I have to admit that. John Carville, where in tarnation have you been? I have been looking for you high and low since dawn. Well, I just went for a little ride, Aunt Millie, to, to get a Christmas tree. See? Christmas tree fiddlesticks. This gentleman helped me cut it down. I'll just take it inside. Be right back, mister. Huh. As if we had any use for a Christmas tree. I'm supposing he's figuring there's going to be a lot of presents under it, too. No, no, I, I don't think so. But just between you and me, I've got a hunch there'll be at least one present waiting for somebody. What are you talking about? Well, no, no, it wouldn't be fair for me to speak before Christmas. You, you know that. You don't mean he's got something for me, do you? Well, no, no, you, you mustn't get so curious uh, quite so early now. But I, I, I thought he didn't like me. I thought he hated having to live here with an old maid like me, and I guess I just don't know nothing about kids. Nothing at all. I don't deserve to get a... a bit. Well, uh, yeah, I... Well, I better get moving. So say goodbye to Johnny for me, and you know, I wonder if you'd give him, give him this. It, it, tell him the little blade on it's kind of dull, but... Uh, a pocket knife? Yeah. How'd you know? Oh, God bless you, mister, and Merry Christmas. M Merry Christmas. Please remember now, beginning December 31st, the Six Shooter will be on Thursdays instead of Sundays. We hope you'll join us in our new time. The Six Shooter is an NBC Radio Network production in association with Review Productions. The transcribed story was written by Frank Burke in collaboration with uh, <laughs> Charles Dickens. Mr. Stewart may soon be seen in the Universal uh, International Picture The Glenn Miller Story. Howard McNear played Scrooge, and special music was by Basil Allow. The entire production was under the direction of Jack Johnston. 
All characters are fictitious and any resemblance to actual characters or incidents is purely coincidental. And now, until Thursday the 31st, this is Hal Gibney speaking. Merry Christmas. That's Project Audion's holiday gift for you. If you enjoyed it, well, there's no time like the present to share this recreation of Christmas past with your friends. And do keep in touch at project.audion at gmail.com with your comments, questions, and suggestions. Until next time, thanks for listening, and Merry Christmas. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Austin. Happy birthday to you. And many more. And many more. Thank you.